Good evening, Book Passage customers. Oh, we are so glad you are joining us this evening. We have an amazing program to share with you. My name is Cheryl Bronstein. I am one of the event coordinators here at Book Passage. Again, I want to welcome you all back to our virtual conversations with authors. Um, Book Passage has two locations. We have our store in Corte Madera. We also have our beautiful store in the San Francisco Ferry Building, and both stores are currently open seven days a week. You can come on in and browse for your books. You can order them online and you can even call us on the phone and we will answer and you can buy your books that way. So I want to thank all of our loyal supporters out there who are, have helped us keep our business going for the past two plus years. Um, it has not been an easy feat, but we really thank you for supporting us. And if there are any new viewers out there tuning into Book Passage, maybe for the very first time, well, we welcome you and we hope that Book Passage will be your main source of books. So if I am talking to any business owners that are listening today, I want to remind you that books make the very best gifts. And we would love to help you buy gifts for your, custom, for your clients or your staff. Book Passage has a very active business to business program. We call it our corporate buying program. We can offer you very generous discounts on titles. We can often get signed copies of books. We ship all over the country and we can usually get the author to, to do a Zoom call with your clients or staff. So it's a great program we have. I wanted to mention it. And if you are interested in this program, please call one of our stores and say, I am interested in your corporate buying program and we will be happy to help you. So again, this is, we're bringing you conversations with authors and this is a virtual event and we welcome you. We have a very busy summer schedule packed with all kinds of events, both in person and virtual. I'm gonna mention a few. We have Alice Waters, the renowned chef and author. She will be in our San Francisco store on Saturday, July 16th at 12 noon. And Miss Waters is releasing the paperback version of her New York Times bestselling book, We Are What We Eat. This is a free in-person event, again, in our San Francisco store. So please join us. Now, we also have renowned researcher and author Michael Pollan, and he will be in person in our Corte Madera store on Saturday, July 30th at 1 p.m. And Michael will be discussing his latest work, This Is Your Mind on Plants. This is a ticketed event. Tickets are still available. So we hope you will join us. Again, check out our website and our calendar. We do not want you to miss any of these wonderful author events and classes that we have. We also would like you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay up to date on all the great authors that we can bring you right into your living room. Well, here at Book Passage, our mission is to enrich, engage, and inspire. And Book Passage has been a Bay Area institution and a family-owned business for over 40 years. So thank you again for supporting us. We hope to be around and to serve you for another 40 years. Well, as a woman of a certain age, I found this book intimate, helpful, informative, and inventive full of the author's personal stories, the stories of many other women, the latest insights and discoveries from psychology to neuroscience to practices such as yoga, meditation, and neurofeedback. The inside story. This is an important work. There are relevations for everyone, no matter what age, though particularly helpful to those that are on the older side, but no matter what level of knowledge. According to Dr. Sands, who is the author, the inside story is about forging a healthier relationship with your actual maturing body, a relationship of respect, appreciation, tenderness, and even love. Dr. Susan Sands, PhD, is a clinical psychologist known for her trailblazing work in female development and body-based disorders. She incorporates Buddhist thought and meditative practices into her work with patients. A former journalist, she's published widely on the topic of eating disorders and body image and is a core faculty member at the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California in San Francisco. 
We are thrilled that she could share this important work with our Book Passage community. Susan is joined today by Saul Rosenberg, PhD. Dr. Rosenberg is a clinical health psychologist with an expertise in healthy aging. He is a retired associate clinical professor of psychology, psychiatry at UCSF. So it is my great honor and privilege to welcome to our virtual book passage stage, a very brilliant duo, Susan Sands and Saul Rosenberg. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you. And welcome and good evening to our uh, audience. Uh, Susan, why did you decide to write this book? Well, you know, something happens as you're kind of passing through your later 60s, I think, because that's when I decided to write the book. Um, it was just becoming more and more clear to me that it's really not easy to be an older woman in our youth-obsessed society. I mean, it's, it's hard probably for you too, Saul, to be getting older. I don't want to uh, ignore the males here, but sexism, as well as ageism is rife in our culture. And so I think women get a double whammy and we have to deal with thousands or of, of media images of young, slim, sexy women um, bombarding us daily. And from, from all of our various um, devices and they're trying to brainwash us into believing that older people no longer have it and are no longer interesting or important so that they can sell more anti-aging products. Um, so as a result, too many older aged or older women, you know, middle-aged or older women, I'm 75, we anxiously fixate on how we look rather than how we feel. And we think we only look good if we look young which means we end up at war with our own bodies, trying to triumph over aging, which of course will never work. And so I decided that I needed, I needed to write something for women. Um, I wanted to help people feel more comfortable with aging and hopefully to even enjoy aging. How, how does uh, the media affect the body image that women have? Well, I mean, everybody in the media, you know, is young and beautiful and sexy and slim. And so this makes it look like this is what our society wants. So as we get older, you know, we diverge more and more from that particular picture. And then, you know, we feel like we're no longer valuable or important. And um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. Um, and so many, so many aging women are, are really, really unhappy because what? I think mainly of the media. Yeah, uh, what's the difference between body image and body sense or body awareness? And, and why, why is that distinction important? Well, you know, the, the, the word body sense is one that I'm using. It's not used so much, but I like it because it suggests that we're sensing our inner body. And that's what I'm encouraging. That's what I'm trying to encourage women to do is to focus our attention down into our, into our inner body and to try to live there rather than focusing on how we're being seen by others. So body image is our picture in our mind of what we think we look like and what we think other people see us as looking like. And so that's very much a picture from the outside and I'm trying to move us from the outside, you know, the, the body of appearance into the body 
on the inside. Um, in other words, not the one we see, but the one we feel. I mean, they're both important. You know, we want to we want to look attractive and we want to look fit and everything, but we already know that. I think people need to know more about how important it is to to be inside ourselves, grounded in our bodies, rooted in our bodies. There's a strength there. There's a feeling of being real there. Okay. Does this uh, difference between body image and body awareness really start in childhood as we learn about ourselves and our sense of self by what other people reflect back to us more than what we sense ourselves about ourselves? Yes. So it's not just the media. I'm glad you mentioned that, Saul. That's, it's so important because, you know, we start developing our body image and our body sense very early in life, depending on how people respond to us. You know, are we, as babies, are we delighted in? Are we cuddled? Um, do we feel valuable? Or do we look into the eyes of our mother and not see ourselves reflected, but we see the mother's distraction or her worry or something? And I, I feel for mothers, I've been one myself, but I'm just saying that, that, you know, how you are seen and responded to in your early years, as well as all the way, you know, up to the present time, it makes a huge difference. How, how does body image affect young adolescent women who develop eating disorders? Well, you know, that's, that's the, the, the real problem um, for most people with eating disorders is their body image. Um, not only is it, um, is it negative for most of them, but even more problematic, it's also not accurate. So if you're anorexic, for example, you may be, you know, thin as a rail. And yet when you see yourself in the mirror, you see yourself as too heavy. So what we found in the research, you know, is that how grounded you are in your body, how much body awareness you have is really a necessary condition we need to feel grounded in our body to have really good body image. And, uh, you know, there's research done on that. They can see that um, people who are focusing in, for example, on their heartbeat and can do it well, you can actually see that that part of the brain that's monitoring our body, in other words, the part of the brain about body image, that's more activated. So we know that there's a connection between our body awareness and our body image. It's not only body image, though. How connected we are to our bodies also has everything to do with how emotionally aware we are and our sense of self. So that all of this we've discovered in the last, say, two decades, it's terribly important to develop this body awareness. And not everybody knows about this. Very few people know about this. And it hasn't been applied to people as they get older, which is the time you really need, I think, to have body awareness so you can take excellent care of your aging body. You know, so you know what your body needs, so you can work out those aches and pains by being really grounded in your body and feeling what your body needs. Yeah. Can mindfulness or various forms of meditation increase your body awareness? Oh, definitely. I mean, that's, that's really, I think, what they're about. 
you know, we've sometimes thought about meditation as being about quieting the mind, and it does, for sure. But the reason it quiets the mind is it focuses you in on your body. And all these wonderful, you know, Eastern practices that have been around for thousands of years, I think they're all, at their heart, they're really about creating body awareness. You know, yoga, tai chi, they all, if you think about it, they all get you in touch with your body. And then, of course, you know, you feel more grounded. Um, you're away from this worried, hurried brain. The body is where you can quiet down and feel rooted and grounded. In, in what focusing... Do you think, Saul? Saul, I wanted to ask you, because you are you have done so much with meditation. What, what Could you say something just from yourself about how it helps you? Yes. Um, the basic meditation instruction in Zen, I'm a Zen practitioner, is to take the posture. And taking the posture is the meditation. So you sit upright and you follow your breath. The breath is the connection between the body, the self, awareness, and the outside world. And it's been used for thousands of years as the entry point into body awareness. Yes. Yeah, that's that's very well said. And do you find it really pleasurable too, as I do when I'm really living in my body rather than up here in my mind? Yes, I, I take meditation and mindfulness breaks multiple times a day in addition to a formal seated meditation practice. Um, right. There really isn't anyone for whom meditation is not healthy and helpful. That's right. The, the other aspect of meditation I want to ask you about is that meditation is a training in attention. You're attending to bodily states. And so when we talk about body awareness, we're talking about attention yeah. and focus. And maybe you could say a little bit about that. Exactly. Um, you know, I think I think you and I have already said quite a bit about it, about moving your you're you're moving your attention, you know, down into your body, but you're also learning to move your attention, you know, into your arms or your legs. I mean, it's not just in here. And the more you can move your attention, the more you can fix things in your body. You know, if you've got an aching back, you can move your attention to that point. And then you know what to do with that aching back. You know how to, you know, twist it out. Um, but, you know, I wanted to say just that the, all the research on meditation, um, and there's lots of it. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies. And Richie Davidson is, is one of the, the major ones. You know, it shows that um, uh, attention is one of the things that is most improved by meditation or, or any meditative techniques you are more able to pay attention and more able to concentrate. Your mind isn't jumping all over the place. So of course this helps us feel better. It helps us work better, helps us do everything better if we have better attention. And the other things, you know, that, the, that meditation is so good for our, is emotion regulation, which we all need. And what that means is just being able to manage your emotions uh, you're not getting overtaken by emotions. You, you, you feel your emotions, you can feel them fully, but you don't let them overwhelm you. You know how to, I mean, we all do at times. There's stuff that happens in life. And I'm not saying that you can meditate, you know, and not react when something cataclysmic happens, for, for heaven's sakes. But in general, you can sort of keep your emotions within a, a range that is um, that is that is manageable, you know. And then the the other uh, 
thing. Compassion is another thing that uh, meditation really helps with. And how helpful is it to be able to feel compassion for others? You know, it's such a bond with another person. And then self-compassion is perhaps even more important. So that when we do things that we regret, you know, when, when our emotions do get out of control, we can bring compassion. We can bring self-compassion to us and forgive ourselves, which makes life ever so much easier. I think it'd be useful to talk about how you think about and work with clients with body image disturbances. So let's imagine a young woman uh -huh. who's actually quite attractive and thin, who has an irrational belief that she's too fat and that she needs to starve herself to conform to the body image that she thinks society wants her to be. How would, how would you think about working with someone like that, either in teaching the meditation or um, working in psychotherapy? How would you help someone understand and come to terms with this irrational belief that's leading to such harmful behavior? Yeah. Well, you know, as a psychotherapist, um, I always start with the experience of the patient. Um, I wouldn't start out by, you know, suggesting anything. I would want to find out more about this particular person and how they think about themselves and how that may have developed from their early life. Um, I'm thinking of, of someone right now who I actually, I actually saw her this afternoon. That's why I'm thinking about her. And, you know, she's, I, I thought of her immediately. She's actually an older woman, um, but she's had uh, the anorexic thoughts throughout her life. And the way that I work with her is, you know, I have her tell me everything about what she's thinking. And then when she tells me how, you know, her tummy is sticking out. And of course, I see somebody who is actually 93 pounds and five foot six. Um, I, I have her talk about what, what is it about the stomach? And then she begins talking, sometimes it becomes more emotional. It becomes less concrete. I feel like I just am too much. I feel like I've always been too much. I was for my parents. I feel like I'm too much for my husband. So that this thing which is physical becomes an emotion. I'm too much. So, you know, that's, that's one way. But then in terms of the practices, at a certain point, I did suggest, you know, that, that, she, um, that she do some meditation. Now, meditation for this particular woman was not her thing, because sitting there, it just made more negative thoughts go through her mind. It, it, it just didn't feel right to me, the way she was talking about meditation. It was, she didn't take to it. So I suggested yoga. Well, she completely took to yoga. And now she does it, you know, rain or shine, three or four days a week. And she's continued to do this for years. And it's been incredibly important for her. And I'm just thinking of, she was, she does it outdoors usually. Um, we're in California. Um, but then, she was actually doing it indoors recently and she looked over at the mirrors on the wall and she looked at her body and she looked at herself from the outside and in this case it was helpful because she said you know my tummy really wasn't sticking out that much i'm really i'm really not that you know that fat 
And I don't think it was a coincidence that it, this happened, you know, after a yoga class where she was really in touch with the inner body. So um, she was ground, she was more grounded. She was sensing her body. So her body sense and her body image, you know, came together that way. Do you want to say anything about that, Saul? About I think it's a wonderful example of um, acquiring awareness. Mm -hmm. And what I would offer is that in meditation is a unique experience in that you're observing yourself thinking as opposed to getting caught up in the story or the narrative in which you're the hero or heroine. And that in that observation, you can see yourself having certain thoughts and you can distance yourself from those thoughts. Exactly. And that that practice is very useful. Right. And it's complementary to what goes on in inside oriented psychotherapy, where you're trying to understand the origin and cause of the thoughts and feelings that you have and, and what you can do to change them. In meditation, you're observing the thoughts themselves, noticing how you turn them into a story and stopping the story, following your breath and coming back to whatever your experience is in the present moment without pushing it away. Right. And I, I, I like that, that idea. I mean, let me just focus in for a minute on how you're, you're going back and forth. You know, you're, you, you're, you're in your body because of the practice that you're doing. And then the thoughts always come up. So then you're watching the thoughts. And then you bring yourself back to the body. And then the mind does what the mind does. It starts thinking again. So you go up into the thoughts again. And so you're, you keep on bringing yourself back to the body back to the body, back to the body, and it becomes more and more of a, of a habit. But there is that back and forth, I'm just aware of. I'd, I'd like to ask you about perception and interoception. Mm -hmm. Perception has been studied in psychology for over 100 years. It's the awareness and interpretation of outside stimuli. Mm -hmm. Whereas interoception is kind of turning perception inward. Could, could you say more about that and what the science that's been developing over the last couple of decades has shown about the value of interoception? Right. It, I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's an amazing new science, and it's just been burgeoning over the last two decades. And basically, interoception is it's a natural body process that's going on all the time. The brain is always monitoring the body trying to see how the body's doing, you know, how, what's the condition of the body? We have to know that in order to survive. So it's a, it's a basic thing that keeps us surviving. Um, so what's really going on is that these signals, these neural signals are, are, are streaming from all different parts of our body all the time. And uh, through complicated sort of, you know, mathematical processes, the body, it, the brain is then trying to predict what may happen next based on, you know, the body sensations. And this process is going on all the time. The body's predicting. And then maybe that isn't really what was happening. You know, like the body, the, the, the uh, you know, if the, some signals came from the body about it being hot. And so, you know, you predicted, therefore, that if the body predicted that it was getting hotter outside. But it turns out that actually your feet were near a fireplace. So that's called a prediction error. So then your, your mind has to decide no, that wasn't right. This is what's happening next. So this is going on all the time. And as I mentioned earlier, you're not only getting a sense of the whole body in this particular part of your brain, 
which gathers all those signals together into a little map of the whole body. You're, that doesn't only give you the sense of the condition of your body, it also gives you your emotional awareness, your consciousness, and your sense of self. So what an amazing science this is, and how it gives, and it proves what people, what the ancients have known for millennia, you know, that it's good to focus in on the body because it's the basis of all these other things. It's the basis of our sense of self, our well-being, you know, our survival, basically. So, so body awareness is really the essential prerequisite for emotional awareness or emotional regulation. Yeah. And for our sense of well-being, too. For, for, for all of these things. Yeah, I mean, our emotions come from our, come from our body. The sensations are turned into emotions. Actually, you know, it, it, before it gets up to the cortex, and because um, that way, you you know whether these sensations are good or bad for us. The emotions are really there to tell us, to put a value on these things. Are we, you know, are we doing okay or not? Do we have to make a quick change in either how we're behaving or how we're thinking about it? Is there, that hopelessly confusing? <laughs> there really is no such thing as just cognitive decision making. We, we, you know, we're clearly not just simply rational animals. We, yeah. we, we don't make decisions based on reason. Reason is important, but emotion really drives us to what's important. It signals our attention and perception and affects all of our decision making. Yeah, exactly. And so if you have this emotion, I'm too fat, I don't look right, I'm too much, you know, what, what, what do you do? You, you, you try and regulate your behavior to change that negative emotion. And in the process, you may be incorrectly perceiving yourself, exactly. engaging in an enormous amount of self-criticism, um, doing the very opposite of self-compassion, which is what you need to heal. Yeah. And, um, you know, potentially not taking in enough calories to fuel your brain. Yes. But one of the ways out of that is to really sink down into your body and feel your body sensations because those sensations are much more real than what you're thinking in your head about your body the body can we can we talk some about the the process of aging yeah. um aging certainly involves loss that's a universal yeah. there are also gains in in aging in other cultures, particularly indigenous cultures, there's a council of elders, yeah. el elder people, both elder men and women, were respected for their knowledge that they had acquired over a lifetime. Yes. Um, that's not always so true in our society. No, because we're ageist. Can, can you say some more about that? Yeah, I mean, there there are so many benefits of aging that our culture should be taking more advantage of. You know, the wisdom of elders is one thing. Um, there's also, um, the research shows, that there's um, more happiness. Our mental health gets better as we get older. And um, this is a finding that's you know, it is, is confirmed over and over again. And the, probably the most, the f most famous example is what's called the U-curve of happiness, you know, where they, they have asked thousands of people over various studies around the world, you know, about how they feel at different points in their lives. And it's a U-curve. People are happiest at the beginning of their life. And then it starts going down, 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 down it it starts dropping more in the 30s and then it reaches its low point in the um, in our middle age 
and 47, according to some of these curves. And that was my worst year. I mean, that's completely right. And then it starts getting, you, you start feeling better, better and better and better as you get older. So it's a U curve. So we're happier as we get older. And according to some of the curves, and, and many of them, you keep on getting happier. So, you know, I'm talking about not being delighted about having aches and pains or, you know, but it, it, if you don't have serious disability, it, mental or physical, and of course many people do, but if you're lucky and you don't have serious disability, you just keep getting happier. And now that that is very cool. And that's my experience. And also there's something called, um, you know, the positivity bias. Um, meaning that like if different ages are, are shown, let's say we're shown pictures in a research project, a number of pictures of people doing various things. And then you ask them later to which ones do you recall? Well, it shows up over and over again that older people remember the positive pictures more. And because we take a positive slant on things. And i that's my experience. Is it yours, Saul? I'm well, I've seen, I, it is my experience, and I've, I've, I've seen an explanation for it, which is that um, as you get older, I'm 75 like you are, yeah. and you realize you have less time, yeah. you start to really focus on what's important, yes. which are experiences, not accumulating possessions. Right. It's time with family and friends and meaningful work and family and contributing, you know, giving back. Yes. Um, rather than being so obsessed with ourselves, um, older people who volunteer are much happier than people who don't. It's yes. good for their mental and physical health. Yes. It helps us more to give than to be given to. You know, that, that shows up again and again. Um, but yes, we, we, that, 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 um, that greater positivity, you know, what, what you're saying, it, it makes us more open to experience, I think, as well as more selective, as you were saying, about what we do, what we, how we spend our time. And we tend to just have a smaller group of people and a smaller group of activities. Um, but this different sense of time, I think, it also leads into a startling sense of present time. I mean, as I've gotten older, there's a way that I just am more in the present. Like I think of myself walking along, you know, the hiking trail, and I'm just listening to the birds more and the, the squirrels, you know, breaking the branches and the trees. And I'm just more able to be in the present. And that's something that a lot of people talk about. One writer calls these moments of present time small seconds of eternity. In other words, you're really out of time. So I think that's another way that we're happier. And, and also their, their brain changes. You know, the, our, our bodies are not as reactive as we get older. Our amygdala which is, you know, the part of the brain that's in charge of, of activating emotion, particularly negative emotion, that gets um, calmer, the amygdala calms down, we're able to take more cognitive control, you know, and move things, move situations into a more positive light. And uh, I also feel, uh, and this is a, one of the main things I talk about in the book, is that because of these changes and the body being, you know, less reactive, um, and after menopause for women, when our bodies are quieter inside, I feel that we're actually primed as we get older to sense and feel our bodies more deeply. So we can be more embodied. 
and embodiment is very, very good for us. And I think some people can only get embodied in older age. It, it, for the first time, we can become embodied, some of us, only in older age. Yeah. Can you elaborate on some of the things you do talk about in the book about managing the loss side of the equation? The, the, what the, the loss side of the equation. There are losses as we age. There are certainly bodily losses and there are cognitive changes. So everyone experiences our memories are not as good as they used to be. Yeah. Um, we, we experience other physical changes. Um, what do you talk about in the book about ways we can manage those losses? Well, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I think we know as psychotherapists that we deal with our feelings better if we can feel them. So the first thing is feeling your feelings of loss. Some people think, I just won't think about it, and then I won't have to deal with the, the horrible pain of losing my friend. But why I say I'm going to be a broken record is I think if you can live more in your body, then you can feel your emotions more because that's where the emotions begin. And if you're down here, especially in the heart area, you can feel those losses and it's not fun to feel them, but then you can actually grieve. You know, you can feel the loss feel it deeply, feel the importance of this person or this activity or whatever it is that you're losing, and then you're more likely to be able to let it go. Yeah, you, you described that. I'd like to read just a sentence from your book and maybe have you elaborate on it. Yeah. Um, you say, when we are embodied, easily feeling and sensing our body, we have the invigorating sense of actually living in our body feeling connected to and at home in our body. We are in present time. Yes, yes, that's right. If you're in your body and not in your mind, you can't be in the past or the, the future. Yeah. One of the ways that I um, I, I work with um, my, my patients and my coaching clients in, um, in therapy, my older patients, to be in present time, is to get them to really pay attention to the present moment. Mm -hmm. For older people, multitasking is the enemy. Mm -hmm. The older brain does not multitask well mm -hmm. for, for numerous neurobiological reasons. And so being present in the moment, being mindful, meditating, doing one thing at a time, noticing body sensations, all brings you into the present and um, really helps you both function and enjoy the present moment, which, after all, is the only one you have. <laughs> That's it. You know, it, it, it looks like we're nearing the end of our time. And I just, I just want to sort of um, send out a call to everybody to um, let's try all of us to change our view of aging. Because as we've said, it's so positive in many ways. So, you know, let, let's, let's try to see it as a, as a culmination you know, not, not an ending, not a termination. Okay, I, I see you, Cheryl. Um, are, are, I would encourage uh, listeners, if they want to submit a question, um, we, we would be happy to entertain them. We're also happy to just keep talking. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just notice what, what, when any questions come in. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to ask you about um, aging and, and stress and body awareness in dealing with the stresses of aging. Mm -hmm. could, could you say something about that? Well, I think that just, just what we've been saying, that it's um, 
we're so much calmer when we're in our bodies rather than in our stressed out minds. So the best thing I think we can do in the moment, you know, just right here, right now, is if we're feeling stress, you know, to move our attention down into our body where it's much quieter and where we can feel what's really going on and get a different perspective because we're not in that that mind that just you know it's like a rat on a wheel it goes over and over the same thing so you want to get out of that and into your body and that will give you a, a, a perspective and it's incredibly calming to be in the body and breathing is so important you know taking a, a long slow breath from the abdomen all the way up you know and then slowly breathing out and the the most relaxing breathing according to James Nestor who just wrote this book on on breathing um, you know the most relaxing is to breathe in through the nose well first to sit you know to sit up so that you know your back is straight and then to breathe in to the count of five and a half so I breathe in one two three four five and then breathe out one two three four five and you just keep on doing this and it's like a circle and according you know to people who've studied this we actually go through about five of these cycles um, it couldn't be per hour I'm forgetting now what it is but it's very built into our natural cycles So I see there's some questions. Yes, um, we have a question. Um, what are a few tips or suggestions to help us connect with our body awareness? Yeah, yes, I think, you know, there, there's the just dropping down into your body and then there are there are all these other techniques like breathing, like meditation. Um, I think, you know, anything that, that gets you into your body, taking a walk gets you into your body. Watching animals running on the beach, they're, they're pure body, you know, and, and that can get us into our body too. What would you say? So, should we move so on? there's a lot of really interesting research on um, walking and being in nature. Mm -hmm. So walking in, in nature is not the same thing as walking down a city street. No. It, it's a completely different brain, body, and mind experience. Yes. And there is a particular value in being in nature as regularly as you can. Yes. And, you know, walking in, in nature is something that almost everybody can do. If, if you can't do any other form of exercise, that is a fabulous thing to do, especially if you walk with a friend and have an emotional connection. There are a few things that are better than walking with a friend in a beautiful surrounding. I mean, for your body and your mind and, um, you know, your well-being. That's a wonder wonderfully said. And it's something I do almost every day. You know, that's my way. And, and I know it's yours too, Saul. Uh, we got another question about how does sleep play into feeling positive and healthy? What do you recommend to those who've had a hard time getting good night's sleep? Oh. Boy, that's hard because, you know, as you get older, sleep does get more difficult for a lot of people. But, you know, all the research shows that, that sleep is incredibly important. Um, you know, not only for the memory consolidation, you know, that, that goes on, but also it seems to, um, 
I can't remember the word for it exactly, but it seems to clean out the brain. You know, there's sort of residue that builds up and, it, and sleep cleans it out, which is, is very good for us. In terms of how to sleep, um, you know, some of these breathing exercises are particularly good for it. You know, like Andrew Weil's um, idea of the, you know, you breathe in to the count of six and then you hold your breath for about seven and then you breathe out for about four. And you can find these in my book or you can find them online, um, breathing exercises. And those are very helpful for sleep. Also yeah. counting, back, counting backwards from 100. But just trying to get out of the brain and into the body, however you do it, is going to help with sleep. There are really good free resources for that online, and I would direct the question or two. Yes. There's, an, there's an association of sleep medicine that has all the latest science, which is quite fascinating. Um, I can summarize it really quickly. I do a lot of work in this area. Um, the best thing to do for sleep is to go to bed the same time and wake up the same time every day, including on weekends. Um, it's really not a good idea to drink alcohol before you go to sleep. If you do drink it, drink it three hours before. If you drink a lot, it will disrupt your sleep because you get a rebound effect as the alcohol gets metabolized, it's agitating. And you wake up in the middle of the night and there's not a whole lot you can do except meditate. Um, meditation is great for insomnia. Right. Let me and, just add to your list um, how important it is to have a completely dark environment. You know, even even a, a, an alarm, even a clock that's got like a red dial can interrupt your sleep. So it, it's really. So I, I, I have another suggestion yeah. to, to, to the questioner. Read a physical version of Susan's book, not the book. <laughs> Don't read it on a computer screen. <laughs> Thank you, Saul. <laughs> Reading physical books, yes, you know, without backlit screens is is much better for you because it regulates the melatonin and hormone cycle in your brain, which is affected by different wavelengths of light. Yeah. And are, are there more questions? Let me take a look. I'd love to be able to take some more questions before we have to stop. Um, okay. This is um, a question that's a little um, more on the, the clinical side, but I, I think it's worth talking about before we end just briefly, which is um, how does trauma get stored in the body? And how does that affect body awareness and, and, and body image? And, um, you know, what, what role th does that play? Yeah. Um, you know, I certainly work with trauma survivors. It's, it, how it gets stored is not something that I really cover in the book. Do you have something you'd like to say about that, Saul? Well, um, the trauma memories, you know, go into the unconscious. I mean, they're not consciously recalled, but they still influence you like other unconscious memories. Yeah. And those memories are stored in the emotion centers in the brain and registered in the body. Yes. Um, you know, Bessel van der Kolk wrote a best-selling book on how the body keeps the score, which is about trauma in the body, which, which yeah. goes into that in, you know, in great detail. I think it's another really important reminder about how important body awareness is. It doesn't matter whether you're a healthy person. It doesn't matter whether you're someone with anorexia. It doesn't matter whether you're 80 or 20 or a man or a woman. Tuning into your body awareness, paying attention to the body signals is good for your mental and physical health. Absolutely. That's a message I think that comes through really clearly in your book. Right. 
and in and clinically in terms of trauma survivors very often you know they they don't have, as you said they don't have conscious memory so you want to ask them what are what are you feeling in your body and very often if you can have them move into their body um, they can then unlock the trauma over a long period of time and with a lot of support from the therapist of course so we're, we're coming to the end of our time susan yeah and I wonder if there are any other thoughts you have that, that you'd like to share. The, the only, I mean, I wanted to share the thought that it's been wonderful talking with you, Saul. And uh, I, I really want to thank Cheryl and Book Passages for having us and hosting us. Um, the only other thing I think is an important part of the book that that is a part of aging well is to confront ageism you know, and to try to ferret out your ageist beliefs. Because, you know, all the research shows that people who think of getting older in negative terms, they do get older. They do, they do get older. And there's amazing research that shows that people with positive stereotypes of aging, or more positive, they not only have you know, fewer heart attacks, they have lower Alzheimer's, but they also live seven and a half years longer. And that's such an astounding figure that nobody could believe it at first, but it's been confirmed over and over again. This is research by Becca Levy. And um, I mean, I'd like to leave you on that note, you know, how important it is to have positive views of aging and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book is because it's so good for you to, to hold positive views in your mind as you get older and in fact it is a, a very fulfilling time and an enlightening time in many ways well, I want to thank you Susan for uh, appearing today <laughs> and I especially want to thank you for for writing this wonderful book um, I highly recommend that everyone read it. And there's a special benefit to reading it at night before you go to sleep. Because the research shows that what you read or the information that comes into your brain before you go to sleep, you tend to remember. <laughs> I thought maybe you were going to say it's so boring, it'll put you right to sleep. No, no. I... <laughs> Not this book. Susan and Saul, what a great hour and such an important work and a very vital book. Again, the book is called The Inside Story by Dr. Susan Sands. And we are so, so grateful that she is on our virtual book passage stage this evening, along with Dr. Saul Rosenberg. It's been a great hour. I want to thank you both for being here and enlightening our Book Passage uh, viewers and our community. You can get the book at Book Passage. Again, this, we love bringing you these free events, and we can do it when you buy your books at Book Passage. So please support independent bookstores, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. This event will be archived, so you can watch it at a later date. Uh, the book, again, Inside Story, available at Book Passage. Thank you all for listening, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great evening. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.